Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the Corsair 3500X ARGB. And this is a full in-depth build guide where I'm going to talk you through how to craft a PC that looks something like this, with additional RS120 ARGB fans, a Capelix cooler, and a rear connect motherboard, as well as a lot of other things of interest. I'm going to leave all the specs in the description down below, as well as timestamps, so you can jump to the relevant point in the video to help you navigate your way around. And I'm going to show you all the different things you need to know, from the fan wiring to the setup of the motherboard and much more besides, so that you'll be able to craft a really good looking PC by the end of it, and something that you can be happy with and happily game away with for hours. I will be showing you how to use a variety of devices in here though, so don't worry if you haven't got exactly the same specs as me, but this case does support rear connect motherboard and that will make it look pretty magnificent. So stick with me to see that, but I'm gonna to talk to you first of all about the different things of interest here. At the bottom, you can pull out this dust filter from the very bottom there, which will be useful in the future for cleaning purposes. And you can also see if we flip the case over that it is large and carries over the entire bottom of the case, which is great because it not only protects dust ingress to the power supply unit, but also to the fans below, which will have as intake if you follow the guide as I've got it set up. And you can see this is nice and easy to remove, but also nice and large, and it should be easy to keep clean over time. The top of the case also has some dust ingress protection here with a little mesh panel underneath. But at the top, you'll also see you've got a power button, USB-A, USB-C, 3.5 millimeter, and a reset switch as well. I'll show you the wiring for that later on. The top comes away by just tugging it upwards from the rear, and then you can see underneath that that there's a dust filter held in place with a little bit of sticky tape and some magnets. So you can take the tape off and then you can take this dust filter off to clean it in future or keep it in place for now. That dust filter might prevent some airflow, which is worth bearing in mind if you find the performance is lacking. Now you can pull the door away and all the doors just come by just tugging away towards you and then lifting them up because there is a little bit of a shelf at the bottom where it will sit in there. But again, the rear panel also has a magnetic dust filter. And again, this is also held on with tape. So just pull that tape off and then you can access that easily as well. These dust filters are obviously pretty handy because you can just take them off in future and give them a quick clean, blowing some compressed air through them and cleaning them up nicely so your case stays clean. Then you can see at the rear, the setup here, there isn't a great deal of space that I want to mention that. So I'm going to show you the cable management for it later on, especially if you're using a rear connect motherboard, it becomes very important. There are a lot of cables to deal with though, from the fans and from the top panel buttons. And obviously some cable management's going to be required to neaten things up there. These are the RS120 ARGB fans, which I'm going to keep in place and they're set to intake as standard. Remove the little accessories box and I'll show you what's in there later on. You'll note there's markings on the case which say it will support both ATX, MATX and ITX motherboards. So here you can see those. We've got an ITX motherboard, we have an ATX motherboard and then you can also put an EATX motherboard in there. So the standoffs allow for the installation of these various different sizes of motherboard and you can see it's possible to fit those all in. Although we're going to end up with an ATX rear connect. At the back here I just wanted to point out at the very top there's actually some hooks for cable management, so you can tidy things up at the top there, which is worth noting. Now, cable management's gonna be a pain with these RS120 fans, but they are daisy-chained together, so they're actually connected together from one fan to the next in terms of both RGB lighting and fan power. Top to bottom, and then at the bottom you have a couple of cables that you need to connect. You also, at the top, have a couple of spare daisy-chain cables for the fan power and for the RGB. Now these are departure from Corsair's previous RGB fans and I've done a separate wiring guide on them but you can see it's a 5 volt connection and then a fan power connection. The cable that comes out of the bottom is quite long which is good but that gives you the ability to easily connect to your motherboard and I'll show you how to do that in a little while and where those plug in. Down here you'll also find the front panel or top panel connections bundled together and so this is the HD audio, USB-C, USB-A, and your power and reset switch in four different cables. 
that we'll need to run through and plug in and I'll show you where those connect up later on but that will then mean that you can use the top panel connections. At the back here there's also an SSD or hard disk drive mounting tray so you can put two drives on here either hard disk drives or SSDs or a mixture of the two. I'm going to use 2.5 inch SSDs in this build but you can see you can take that off and when you do that gives you access to be able to get to the back of the motherboard which can be useful. The fans will have stickers on which you want to take off at some point and tidy things up a little bit and that's on the front and the rear and then I'd recommend going about cable tidying. You're going to see a lot of cable tidying as we go through this build and the reason for that is because we're using a rear connect motherboard we need to make sure there's no cables in the way of the various different connectors and also we don't want to end up with cables touching the connectors there's not a great deal of space at the back of the case. So getting these cables tidied away will help you close the door, but also just to manage things in a neat way and make your life a little bit easier. For this build, I'm using the Corsair RM Shift 1000X power supply unit, which I've done a separate guide on. I've also got some pro sleeved power cables here. So these are Corsair's individually sleeved cables, which are nice looking and easier to set up but if you don't want to do that you can use the standard cable so I'm going to show you the wiring for the power supply and everything you need to know there don't forget we've got timestamps if you want to leap forward in the video but we're using the 24 pin power connectors here starting off I'm going to show you how to plug these cables in where they plug in and the logic for it outside the case so it's really easy to see so you plug in the 24 pin power connectors that are split into two parts into the motherboard ports on the power supply unit and then on this rear connect motherboard, they plug in on the left hand side at the top. If you're using a standard motherboard, it'll be right hand side, but you're looking for the large 24 pin power connector there. Don't do this just yet. I just want you to be able to see where it would happen and how to do it. But you can only plug it in one way round because it has a little plastic clip on it that needs to hook over the port on the motherboard. And you do need to make sure it's fully plugged in because otherwise it won't power on and that will become apparent later on. You then have two CPU power connectors which are marked CPU on one end. The other end plugs into the power supply unit and the port's marked PCIe slash CPU. And these are EPS power cables that will plug into the motherboard to make sure it's got enough power for overclocking and also just generally. So you want to make sure you seat these in to the power supply unit and then they plug in on the top right of this rear connect motherboard. On other motherboards, they plug in at the top left if you're using a standard motherboard. And then you can also split these cables apart. So if you have one port that will only take four pins, for example, instead of two eight pins, you've got one four pin, one eight pin. You can do that with one of these cables. You can just split them apart and plug that in. So that is one option there, which is pretty handy. And now we're on to SATA power, which is for SSDs, hard disk drives, the commander controller, which you're going to be using later on and other things. So this is this cable here with the flat power connectors on it. Obviously the small type 5N plugs into the power supply unit in the port marked SATA and PATA at the top there. You plug that in and then you can connect up different devices to this because there's a daisy chain cable with multiple connections on it. So for example, we can plug in this crucial SSD to it. You can use a hard disk drive on there. You can connect multiple drives to one power cable which makes life really easy for cable management but you will notice you can only plug it in one way because it has an l-shaped connector on the inside so just watch out for that now for gpu power now there are going to be different cables here depending on what you're doing you will find that you have pcie power connectors that look like this these are the traditional power cables which are eight pin on one end and then type 5 on the other end that plugs into the power supply unit. Now if we take this 3090 for example, that requires two 8-pin PCIe power connectors, so we'd use two cables to plug into this, and you can see those power connectors on the right-hand side. So if you're installing a GPU like this, once it's fully put into the case, obviously you'd run the cables from the rear to the front and then plug them in like this. Now with this, you have to pinch the two cables together and slot them into place. It's a six pin and a two pin. You need to push together and connect up so it becomes an eight pin. And then you have to push it into the little hole and notch it over the little latch that's in there. So again, there's a hook that holds that in place. You need to make sure that's fully seated because if it's loose, then you might not get enough power to the graphics card and therefore you won't get the best performance out of it, which is important to note. The other end obviously plugs into the PCIe port 
on your power supply unit. So make sure you do this. And if you have a third port on your graphics card, then you can use a third cable and plug that in and make sure that it is properly powered. Now you might find that you have a newer series GPU, like a 40 series from Nvidia, for example, and you can then use 12 volt high power cable instead. So this is designed specifically for these GPUs and it has this special connector on one end which delivers 600 watts of power up to and you can plug in the two PCIe connectors to the power supply unit and then the other end will plug into the graphics card and this allows you to abandon that horrible adapter that usually comes with the 40 series cards and use this single cable instead it's a lot neater and cleaner and easy to connect as well but you do need to make sure it's plugged all the way in and there's no unnecessary pressure on the cable so make sure that cable's not really taut in your build now on this rear connect motherboard things are a bit different because we're going to plug in the power connectors for the graphics card at the rear here you can see we've got three eight pin pcie power connectors or a 12 volt high power connector back there you'll use this if you're like me and you're using a rear connect gpu so you've got a btf gpu which actually has power coming from the motherboard rather than a power cable that plugs into the graphics card directly so i'm going to use this 12 volt high power connector for example plugged in there and then the gpu will get power from the front of the motherboard and i'll show you that a bit later on so work out what power cables you'll need based on what i've just shown you and then you're going to plug in all the cables that you're going to need before you install the power supply into the case this just makes life a little easier now with a shift power supply you can definitely still access the ports on here if you need to plug in extras but if you're using a different power supply this pays off because it's much easier to be able to plug in extra cables if you've made a mistake now for the power supply unit we want to make sure the fan is facing downwards this is pulling air from below through the venting that i showed you earlier on and then it will keep the power supply cool there are four screws included with the power supply which you can then secure the power supply to the case in four different corners and if you take a look at the rear you'll see that the holes line up with holes on the case that you can then screw into. There's actually multiple holes here that you can see that you can access, so you can screw those in. Now the next part is making sure the cables are cable tidied. Now I know where these are going to go, and the cable ties that I'm using are included with the accessories box, by the way, but I would recommend getting some extra, especially if you're using a rear connect motherboard, because it will make your life a little bit easier. But what I'm trying to do is find points in here where I can tie these cables down. Now I'm tying the 24 pin power cable together quite a bit because it's quite big, takes up a lot of room and I want to try and make sure it's neatened up nicely. For the 8 pin CPU power cables I'm going to tie those up as well and try and neaten them up or down the right hand side. Now take care when doing this that you don't secure things too hard or too permanently at this stage because you need to make sure you can have enough slack in the cables to be able to plug in in the relevant places but i do want to make sure that these cables are out of the way and start the process of neatening things up because as you'll see a bit later on they will get in the way of some of the ports that we're going to plug in at the back of the motherboard for example and snip off the extra from the plastic cable ties taking care obviously not to cut cables while you're doing it so that we can make sure everything is a bit neater as we go through because we're going to add more and more cables to this. Now for the motherboard setup, for, so for this I'm using a Zeus Tough Gaming Z790 BTF motherboard. Now this is obviously a rear connect motherboard which means all those cables are going to go at the rear which will neaten things up. I'm using the WD Black SN850 NVMe SSD in this build along with two crucial SSDs as well. But if you're installing an SSD, I'd recommend putting an NVMe in the top slot here. So you just take off that heat shielding from the top and then slot the drive into that port up there. Now this will ensure it gets good speeds, but also that thermal pad on the heat sink will ensure it's nice and cool. You can see there's got a little Q latch there, so you just turn that latch to hold it in place. Take the sticker off the thermal pad, reseat the heat shielding back down and then secure it. Don't take the sticker off the NVMe and I've done a video separately on why you shouldn't bother doing this. Now for the CPU we lift the lever, lift the latch and then gently seat the CPU in. You'll notice there's a couple of notches at the bottom you need to line up with the CPU in the socket and then gently seat it down. Put the cover back over the top, put the latch back down and then that is nicely secured. For RAM I'm using two sticks of course as Vengeance 
DDR5 RAM, and you need to put that in the second slot and the fourth slot. So the two gray slots here, that's A2 and B2, and that'll make sure that those sticks of RAM can run at the right speed. If you put them in the wrong places, your system might not boot or you won't get the best speed out of them. For this build, I'm using the Corsair IQ H150i Elite Capelix XT, but I'm doing things a little bit differently because this obviously comes with pre-installed fans. I'm actually going to swap them out with some RS120 fans just so that the system matches. But I'm also going to upgrade the pump cap with the LCD upgrade kit, which I've done a separate video on. I want to use these RS120 ARGB fans throughout just so that it's uniform, and I want to show you how you can do that if you want to do the same. So these additional fans have the same sort of logic as the case fans that are already pre-installed. They have those daisy chain cables on them so you can easily set them up and wire them. And what I'm going to do is put them onto the radiator in this way because we're going to install it on the top of the case. So we're going to set those so that they're pulling air through the radiator and exhausting out of the top. Do need to make sure cable tidying nicely though because there's a lot of cables to deal with here and we're going to set those up and plug them all in together and then actually we're going to connect them up to the CPU header on the motherboard which I'll show you in a little bit. But the thing that's interesting here is obviously we're abandoning the commander core for the powering of the fans because the ones that come with the Capelix cooler use the commander to control them. You might want to stick with that logic but that's up to you. For this, we do need to make sure we have the backplate installed though. So this is the Intel backplate, which then seats on the back of the motherboard. It has a 3M sticker on it, which you need to stick to the back of the motherboard and then put the standoffs through the holes in the four corners there. And then we have some standoff screws that we need to secure through to those holes. And then you secure the pump head to that later on, which I'll show you in a little bit. But this is basically preparing the motherboard before we install it into the case, just because it's a little easier to do now, especially accessing the back plate. As I've shown you, you can remove the SSD tray and then you can access the back. So if you want to, you could do it at that stage. But this also means you're not going to drop any of the standoffs and lose them in the case. So <laughs> I prefer to do it this way. So you screw those standoffs into the four corners and make sure they're tightened up fully and fully secured there. There's no wobble in them. And then you should be able to nicely secure things up. Now, I said I'd show you the accessories box, which obviously I've already opened because I used the plastic cable ties in a few different places already. But in here are the cable ties and a number of other things, including the various different screws. So you can see them laid out here. We have some long fan screws, which are for installing the fans on the bottom. And then you've got motherboard and SSD screws and hard disk drive screws. You can pause here and reference the manual if you want to quickly have a look and work out which screws are which for your own reference. We also have motherboard standoffs, but I wouldn't worry too much about that if you're using a standard motherboard it'll install nice and easily. So this ATX motherboard, for example, will just seat down in place there really easily. And then you use the motherboard screws that I've just shown you to secure it in the standoffs in nine different places. So there's nine screws that you need to screw in across the middle, bottom and top rows, three in each of those positions. So secure that down to the case. And then we can plug in the power cables that I showed you earlier. Now, the two 8-pin CPU power connectors plug in at the top here. A quick note that you don't want to do this if you're going to be putting the SSD tray back in, and I'll show you why later on, because they actually get in the way. So it's just something to keep in mind. But you can plug these cables in and then use those loops to cable tie you some more. One of the things of note here, for example, as you'll see, there's obviously those holes at the top of the case which are designed for standard motherboards to run the cables through. You'll find if you don't tidy these cables up properly up here, they'll be visible through the front and it won't look as neat. But also we need to make sure these are out of the way of those top ports because we've got various different ports like the CPU optional fan headers, for example, chassis fan headers, 5 volt RGB connections and more at the top that need to be accessed. And then I'm going to do the same with the 24 pin power connectors. So running those cables through, you can see I'm using black cable ties now because I ran out of the standard ones I had to use my own. And then you're just going to plug that cable in. So I have secured it in a couple of places but now I'm trying to plug it in and then cable tie. 
At this point, I discovered there's a bit of an issue. So the case has a bit of metal that runs along the side of the motherboard there, and this meant that I couldn't push the 24 pin power connector all the way in. I've discovered a way around this, and that's to loosen all the motherboard screws, and then you can push the motherboard over to the left-hand side a little bit. You just basically have to force the motherboard over very gently with a little bit of pressure, just convincing it to go over, and then you can plug the power cable in. It's important to do this because you need to be able to plug that power cable all the way in. If it's not fully seated, your system won't power on. Obviously, and then I need to re-secure those screws. So if you have the same issue, just loosen the screws a little bit, shift your motherboard over a little bit to the left, and then you should be able to plug the cables in. And then once that's done, I want to try and tidy these up because as you can see, they're quite large. The 24 pin power cable can be a bit of a problem. So just securing it down to the various different areas in the case, tightening the cables by tying it to itself, tying the cables to the case itself. And sometimes you'll see me tying cables to other cables. And that's just because there's not very much channeling back here. There's not a great deal of space. I want to make sure that we can close the door, but also that I can just access the ports easily and things are nice and neat because by the time we get to the end, once you've got all the fan power cables, there's going to be a real mess back here. So just securing these cables in various different places, it is worth doing through each step rather than trying to do it all at the end and then snipping off the plastic cable ties from the various points so again we can neaten things up and that's all just tidy and then we have the usb a and usb c connections these are for the top panel on top of the case you'll find them on the left hand side of this rear connect motherboard here and they can only be plugged in one way so watch out for that because they both can only be plugged in one way you should hear the usb c one click into place when you pushed it in for example on a standard motherboard they'll be on the right hand side if you're looking from the front near the 24 pin power connector and then again tidying these cables up these ones also protrude in an awkward way so i had to tie them in multiple positions to themselves in order to neaten them up and then try and tie them down to the bottom of the case just to try and neaten things up there then we have the hd audio connection which is for the 3.5 millimeter jack on the top of the case and that plugs in on the right hand side here the bottom right of the motherboard on most motherboards standard motherboards would be on the left bottom and you should find it's marked something like f audio or hd audio you'll notice it's missing one pin so it's easy to work out which way around that plugs in and how you're meant to sort that out plug that in and then obviously we're going to try and tidy that up as well and then we have the f panel which is the front panel connectors for the power button and for the reset switch and that goes on the opposite side of the motherboard down here in the bottom left you'll see that this is marked panel or f panel and includes a bunch of different connectors again there's one pin missing so you can see where it lines up but it's on the far left hand side here of this motherboard and it pushes it into there. And that would be on the right hand side of a standard ATX motherboard. But you slot that in and then that will allow you to power the machine on. So you've got to make sure that's plugged in if you want to use the power buttons on the front. And then more cable tidying. You can see I'm using a lot of cable ties throughout the case to make things nice and neat. And this is especially important now with the RS120 fans. So these fans obviously have multiple connectors on them. You've got fan power and RGB. So those go to chassis fan headers and the 5 volt RGB headers. But then you also have additional connections which you can run from one fan to the next. I'm going to use these fans not only on the radiator but also as intake and exhaust fans in the case as well. I've done a separate guide on how to connect these up that I'll link to in the description if you want to find a more in-depth and detailed setup guide and tips and tricks. But essentially what we're looking for is two connectors to run from the fans onto the motherboard. So you're looking at the rear here, for example, for the chassis fan header and for the three pin five volt RGB headers. So you can see it's marked add gen two on here, for example, and it has three pin connections on it. And that will allow you to control the fan lighting for your motherboard software and then chassis fan header for the fan speed from your motherboard software or from the BIOS. So you plug those cables into there. Now the way these fans work is they go daisy chain together and then you can connect them up to the motherboard on those various different connectors. I would recommend only daisy chaining three fans together though. 
at least for fan power. For the RGB, you could probably get away with more. Some motherboards might only have a couple of RGB headers, so this becomes important. But essentially what you do is you take one fan, you connect the power connection cable that you can see here from that fan to the next fan's port like this, so that, that connection's connected up together. And then you do the same thing, but with the RGB connector. So you can find you have one of these cables has a cover over the top of it. You pull that cover off, there's some pins underneath it. You connect it up to this connector here, and then that allows the RGB to go across the fans as well. So you repeat this process across the three fans. So one fan's connected to the next with these cables, the RGB and the fan power, and then the next fan's connected to the next one. And then in the final fan in that group, you can then connect those cables directly to the motherboard as I've just shown you, and then all three fans will be powered off of two connections. This makes things a bit neater on your motherboard and in terms of cable management, and it also means that you don't have to try and find connections for each of the fans because you'd need two cables per fan and it becomes tricky and then you need either a fan controller or something else. So you can see here with the standard pre-installed fans, for example, I'm going to put them into the 5 volt header and chassis fan headers at the bottom of the motherboard. So that's the three intake fans on the side of the case that are installed as standard. You run those cables from the bottom fan to this port there. Then I also wanted to show you the 12 volt high power connector that I mentioned for the graphics card earlier on. We're going to plug that in on the left hand side here as a reminder. And again, the problem I have here is the same one I had this with the 24 pin power connector is that I just couldn't push it all the way in because of the metal of the case. So I had to loosen the motherboard screws again in order to be able to then negotiate the motherboard over a little bit. And so I could then push the power cable in. If this power cable isn't seated all the way in, then your GPU might not get enough power and then it won't run properly. And then that could cause problems. And we've all heard the horror stories about these 12 volt high power connections melting as well so they're not ideal. Now you tie these cables together and neaten things up. What I was trying to do here was to run these cables across so that I could neaten them up by connecting them to the CPU power connectors and try and keep things tidy there. What I wanted to do ideally was to hide this power connector behind the SSD tray because I thought I could basically get it out of the way and tidy it up. But also just running it across here means that you take some of the excess cable and neaten things up there. Now for the SSD mountings, you'll see these little screws here. We're going to use two SSDs on this tray that comes off the back of the motherboard. They essentially go behind the tray and then you use the little screws to secure them in. Notice that I'm making sure the connectors are on the left hand side of the tray because then I'll be able to run the power cables and the data cable connections to them really easily. You've got four screws per SSD and then you can secure them down like that. Now note you could put a hard disk drive on here instead if you wanted to but I know most people would probably prefer to use SSDs so that's what we're doing with this build. You just secure both lots to here and then we can secure it back over the rear of the motherboard. Now, as I mentioned, there is an issue here, or at least I had one, with the CPU power connections on the back of the motherboard and this tray. Because this tray has some hooks on the top of it, which needs a hook into some points on the back of the case. You can see them here in the shot. They basically grip onto the top of the case and then it secures with that screw. So I had to unplug the CPU power connectors that you can see at the top in order to put this back in place like this. And then I found because the SSDs are mounted to the rear of the tray, I can't actually hide that cable away like I wanted to, which is a shame. So instead it's gonna have to just run over the top. Not the end of the world, but I was just trying to neaten things up a little bit. And then obviously securing the tray with thumb screw at the bottom there, so it's put into place. Next stage, you want to run the data cables from the drives to the motherboard, so they'll plug in up here. These will come with your motherboard, and you basically plug those two cables in, and then we're gonna run those down to the bottom SATA ports. So generally speaking, you usually find them at the bottom middle of the standard motherboard. On this one, they're on the bottom left. And we'll plug those in down there, and then that'll allow for the data transfer from those drives so that you can communicate with them when you're in Windows. And then we run the SATA power cables that I showed you earlier on, so the flat cables 
they'll run up and plug in. Again, a reminder, they have an L-shaped connector on them, so they can only plug in one way, so don't try and force them. But you will see that there's enough slack here that you can plug two drives into a single cable. And there's still an additional spare connector that you can use for other things, which you're going to use for the commander core a bit later on. Now, replug those two 8-pin CPU power connectors at the top. Don't forget we had to take them out of the way to put the SSD tray in, for example. And then we're going to go about the other fan installation. So I've got some more RS120 ARGB fans. I'm going to mount two at the bottom using these long screws. You might choose to use three. I just didn't have three. And also on the far left of the case, the cage for the power supply unit is sitting right below where you'd mount the fans. So it could end up not being very efficient in terms of cooling. But these two points that I'm using should be fine. So put the fans face down so you can actually see the back of the fan like this. And that will ensure that it's pulling cold air from below. So pulling cold air from the bottom of the case and from below the case. And then blowing upwards onto the graphics card and on the motherboard. The cables then obviously need to be dealt with and we've got two lots of cables so again we're going to connect them together at the rear daisy chaining the 5 volt RGB connection and the fan power connector together for those two fans and then we're going to connect them to the motherboard. You could connect the RGB connection to a daisy chain connection on one of the other fans if you don't have enough connectors. But here I've got another spare one down the bottom, so I'm just going to use that. And then the chassis fan header can also connect on the left here next to the SATA ports. So that then powers those two fans that are connected to the bottom. Then for the mounting of the 360mm all-in-one cooler, you might want to work out which way round you want to mount it. You have this option, for example with the tubes on the right hand side, which is the one I'm going to go for because I can make sure they don't get in the way of the rear fan that way. But you could alternatively mount it the other way around if you prefer. You could put the tubes on the left hand side and mount it this way around. Now it's worth noting that I'm top mounting the radiator in this case for ease, but actually I've found traditionally that side mounting the radiator is better for performance. Now I've done a video separately on this that I'll link to in the description. But basically, in this instance, we're going to mount these fans this way, face down into the case, so they're exhausting out of the top. And then we need to manage those cables together. So just as a reminder, I've mentioned this already, but it can be a bit complicated. So we're going to connect these fans together with the same sort of logic I've already said, basically making sure all three are daisy-chained together in terms of the power and the RGB connection with one spare connector left over once we've sorted this out and seated the radiator in place. So with those cables set up that way, we're then going to run them through to the rear, which is a bit of a fiddle with how many cables there are, and then secure the radiator to the top of the case with the small screws and washers that are included with all-in-one cooler, and then seat the pump head down over the standoffs that we installed earlier on. So you'll notice that we've got the tubes on the right-hand side of the pump here. We're also going to secure corner to corner with the standoff screws that is put in here. So we're going to put those thumb screws down over the top and then secure diagonally from one corner to the next and I'd recommend using a screwdriver for it as well, but be careful not to over tighten. So don't force it, just screw it until it stops and won't go any further. This ensures that it's nice and secure and not loose, because if the pump head's loose, then it won't get the efficient cooling out of it, and you might find your CPU temps go a bit too high. And then we've got to try and run these cables to the rear behind the radiator. And this is a bit of a fiddle, but you've got a large thick cable which needs to connect to the commander core and this tiny cable which plugs into the AIO header at the top here. I'm using the AIO pump connection here because we're going to use the CPU fan for the three fans coming from the radiator. So for the fan power from those three fans that we daisy chained together, you want to connect to the single final cable to the CPU fan header. That will ensure that the motherboard's able to control the fan speed of that. Then there's a USB connection coming from the pump head, which obviously is for the LCD display, which connects to the USB port in the middle there, and that plugs in there. And then we have the commander. Now this is usually used for the fans that are included with the cooler, but you do also need to plug 
a big connection into it to make sure that the pump works properly. And then this requires another USB connection and a SATA power connection. So it's the same cable we used for the SSDs earlier on. Luckily, we've got a spare connector down here that we can plug into. Obviously, we're only using the commander for the pump head, not the fans anymore, but we still do need it. And you'll see it fits nicely to the back of the SSD cage at least. And then that's mostly set up. Now, what I want to do here is just a quick test boot to make sure all the cables are connected properly. Plug in the power cable, press the power button, and you should find that everything turns on. You can see we've got the RGB lighting from all the fans set up, the display's working, the pump's working on the all-in-one cooler. So everything's set up correctly at the moment. But we've still got a few more bits to do. So I'm going to add an additional rear exhaust fan to this, as well as obviously putting the GPU in. If you had a third fan, you could obviously put that in the bottom as well. Now for the standard fan mounting on the rear, you have these screws here, which are for the fan screws. And you're going to screw that single fan in at the back. Again, face inwards, so the blades face inwards. And then this will be an exhaust fan running alongside the top fans, which are obviously exhausting through the radiator. So this will take the hot air out. So the side fans that mount as standards are intake, two extra bottom intake fans, and then these top ones are all exhaust. So running that cable through to the rear and then securing this fan in place by screwing it in from the back using those little screws that I just showed you. Obviously we're running these cables through to the holes at the top there. You could make use of those hooks that I showed you right at the beginning of the video to try and neaten things up a little bit maybe. But it's not actually too bad to get these cables through and if you tidy them up at the rear, you can then make sure they're not really visible and it all looks pretty good by the end of it. So four screws to secure that and then run that cable through to the rear. Now what I've done here is I'm taking the RGB connector from the three side mounted fans and connecting it to that rear fan, daisy chaining that into the connection. That way it's going to get RGB lighting without needing an additional connection on the motherboard. But then I'm going to plug the power cable into the fan power connection on the motherboard. So the chassis fan or system fan header on the motherboard. I wouldn't recommend trying to connect four fans together in the daisy chain because motherboards might not be able to handle it. Various different ports on there might not handle the right amount of power. So it's just better to only stick to three fan power connections. And then you could see that that fan was working too. Now for the GPU installation, removing the two PCIe brackets from the rear, the second one down and the third one down in this instance for this GPU, you might need to remove three of these brackets if you have a larger graphics card. But this is a rear connect GPU. So you can see it's got an additional connector on it that plugs into this particular motherboard that then gives it the power. So it doesn't need any power cables. If you need to run power cables from the rear, for your GPU because you've got a standard one obviously you do that after installing the GPU like this and plug them in like I showed you earlier on and then put in the case back together because we've now finished the build so just pop in the top back on the top of the case there and then you can see the finished product so this is what it looks like I'm pretty happy with how it's come out and it is actually very nice looking obviously the RGB lighting is controllable via your motherboard software, but this is what it looks like as standard. And we will need to run IQ for the pump display. So if you're using the screen like I am, you'll still you'll need to use IQ for that. But the fans won't be controllable via IQ because they're all connected to the motherboard instead. For the fan speed, you want to go into the BIOS and tweak some of the things in there. And for the RGB, you'd need to download your motherboards software, or you could use something like Signal RGB, which gives you control over RGB lighting and various different lighting sinks in there. And then we're going to replace the glass panels. There's plastic peel on both sides of the glass, so you can remove that beforehand if you prefer, or if you want to be fancy like me, you can pull it off afterwards, just so you can show it off in a video. Um, some people would suggest not doing this because the static buildup might cause problems and could fire your PC, so maybe just do it off the glass and with the PC still apart, just give a nice satisfying peel to it. But you want to make sure you do that at the last stage of the build so we don't put the fingerprints all over the glass. And then we just secure it by pushing those panels back in. Start from the bottom. As I mentioned, there's little hooks on the bottom there which sit into the case. 
and secure it down. And then you have the finished product and a very nice setup indeed. Now, there is one other thing that's worth doing, and that's going into the BIOS, making sure XMP is turned on, and that we tweak the fan settings so that your fans aren't running really loud. So we're just going to quickly do that as well. Once your PC is connected to a monitor, we want to then mash the delete key when you've powered it on until you get into the BIOS, and then we're going to change a few settings. You want to make sure that XMP is turned on on the left-hand side here. So enable XMP, which will make sure that your RAM runs at the right speed. And then another setting that was worth changing is resizable bar. So you see resizable bar at the top here, make sure that's turned on as well. Then we want to go into the advanced mode down at the bottom right here, click into advanced mode and find the fan control settings. In this case it's Q fan. From there, we want to select the various different fan headers that we've used. So chassis fan headers, for example, and then set them to PWM mode. This will ensure that the system can control the fan speed and that you can adjust the speed of the fans easily from the BIOS. And you can also use fan control, which is a tool that you can download in Windows if you want to adjust it, or your motherboard software in Windows. But make sure these are set to PWM mode. And you'll see that there's then a graph for the speed at which these fans adjust. You can also select from various different fan speeds, for example, silent if you prefer your system to run quietly. You can apply it to all the different fan groups as well, so you can make everything run quietly, or faster if you want better performance, and set it to your personal preference there. It's important to do the first step of this set in its PWM mode so it is easily controllable, especially if you find your fans are a bit loud. And then just save changes and reset. And then on to setting up Windows. So on a separate PC, search for the Windows Media Creation tool. And we're going to download the latest update for Windows 11 and install that. So there's a Windows Media Creation tool here, which you'll need a USB drive for. I've shown how to do this on your phone if you don't have a spare PC. I'll link to that video. And then you can just basically go through the process, use this creation tool to install it on a drive that it's external and then you'll be able to plug it into your new PC that you're building and install Windows. So you have to wait a little bit of time for this to happen. But once it's complete, you want to take the drive that you've installed it onto, plug it into the back of your motherboard and then turn the PC on. You should find that it then automatically recognizes there's a Windows creation drive plugged in. And then when it starts through the boot process, it should take you into the tool for installing Windows. You'll then need to follow the on-screen prompts to install the windows relevant to your location. I'm obviously going for United Kingdom because that's time and format and also the keyboard method, but you might want to choose other ones. Apologies for some of the focus on some of these clips. It went a bit wrong, but basically you want to go through the steps here. If you have a product key, enter it. If you don't, just click I don't have one. You can do that later on. Then Windows 11 Home and then the installation for that and just keep clicking through. We want to do custom install, so install Windows only. Click on that and then select the drive that we're using. Click new to create the relevant partition on that and set it up. And then just keep clicking next, go through and start installing Windows. Now we'll take some time to do this. And obviously we also need to make sure we get the updates once we get into there. But you go through, click that and then wait, be patient. And then what you will find is eventually, once it gets to the part where it's about to finish, you'll need to unplug the USB drive that you plugged in for when it reboots. Otherwise, it will try and use this again. So just once you get to the end of the process here, when it says it's about to restart, just keep an eye on it. Because when it goes through that restart process, as you can see, the bar's filling up here. Take that drive out and then allow it to reboot and it should just reboot into the final stages of the Windows installation without the need for that drive. And that's the end. Hopefully you found this video useful. If you did, don't forget to check out the links in the description to other related content. Let me know in the comments what you thought and if I helped you out because that really helped other people see the video as well and I'd greatly appreciate it. And thanks very much for watching. You've made it right to the end of the video, you brilliant legend you. If you've enjoyed it, click that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up, and drop me a comment down below if you've got any questions. If you really enjoyed it, consider joining the channel and see the benefits of doing so. Check out these other videos. You might well find them interesting or useful. And most importantly, 
have a great life.